1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present in the courtroom with uh, his attorneys, and the prosecutors are present as well. We are outside the presence of the jury. Um, we have a couple of juror issues that I want to take up before we bring the jury in. Uh, first, we have juror 535, who's indicating that she thinks she recognized someone in the gallery. And then we have juror A72, who is having issues related to daycare. So let's bring in uh, 535 first, please. The record should reflect that juror 535 is now in the courtroom. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. My understanding is that uh, you think you may have recognized someone in the gallery. Is yes. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Who, who do you think you recognize? Her name is Joy. Joy? Mm -hmm. Do you know a last name? Uh, no, I don't. When, when do you think you saw Joy in the courtroom? After our morning break and before the uh, lunch break. Okay, so was today the first day when yes. you noticed Joy? Yes. Uh -huh. Joy? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, let, let me have you uh, step out for just a moment, okay? Okay. Please. Thank you. Do the, par do the parties know? Uh, the record should reflect that juror 535 has now exited the courtroom. Do the parties know if there was a person named Joy here this morning? I can double check, Your Honor, but I don't know of anyone named Joy. Okay, could you double check, please? And, of course, the people who were here this morning may not be the same people who were here this afternoon. But what about on the defense's side? Anyone you're aware of whose name is Joy? No. 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 Okay, Mr. King is indicating no. And for the record, Ms. Tish McGuire, just check with uh, folks in the gallery. Ms. Tish McGuire? Your Honor, there is a person in the gallery named Joy. Um, she says that she knows one of the people in the theater um, who was just at the theater that night. It's not a person who will testify in this case. You mean Joy is not a person who will testify? Joy is not a person who will testify, nor is the person that Joy knows a person who will testify in this case. And do you know whether the person that you spoke with whose name is Joy knows the juror? Sorry, I should have asked that information, Your Honor. That would have been good. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's good tomorrow, so. This, this is why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> Your Honor, she is the... Uh, She's an acquaintance of someone that Joy knows. She does not know the juror personally, and she says that she's an acquaintance of her financial advisor. So 
So she's an acquaintance of someone that Joy that that the juror knows. Correct. But Joy doesn't know the juror directly. Correct. Uh, do you folks want me to ask uh, the juror if this is the joy that she's referring to or more open-endedly whether she sees the joy that she thought she recognized this morning here in the courtroom this afternoon? Can you pass the microphone to Mr. King, please? Thank you. Uh, we don't have any specific requests, Judge. Um, I guess given those two options, the more open-ended approach might be better to take. Okay. All right. And the people? Judge, we do not take a position. However the court wants to proceed, is fine. All right. Is anybody asking me that I just leave this alone? We would have no objection if you just wanted to leave it alone. It doesn't sound like this is a person that's going to be, that anyone involved is going to be a witness in the case. So we're not asking the court to do anything. Hold, hold on one second. I may be wrong about this, Judge. Okay. Then corrected. Um, maybe just if you were to briefly inquire anything about seeing this person here today that would affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror or something along Okay. Those lines. I think that makes sense. All right, let's bring her back in, please. record should reflect that juror number 535 is back in the courtroom. Um, how are you? Okay. Still okay? <laughs> I'm All right. still okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, anything about this person that you saw this morning that you think you recognized, uh, this joy that would affect your ability to be fair and impartial in this trial? No. And I have no idea whether this person will testify or not, but if she testifies, Will that affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror? No, it will not. And will you be able to assess her credibility if she testifies in the same way that you would assess the credibility of all other witnesses? Yes, sir. And will you be able uh, to uh, assess her credibility pursuant to my instructions? Yes, sir. All right. Um, it doesn't sound like this is someone you know well. Is that, am I right about that? Uh, I, she's an acquaintance of my uh, significant other. An acquaintance of your significant other. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not someone that you have a, a friendship with, it doesn't sound like. No. No? Okay. Any concerns that you have? Any other concerns that you want to tell me about? No, I just felt that I needed to tell you that and I you recognize did, someone. You did the right thing. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. All right. Let me have you step out again, okay? Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, the record should reflect that juror number 535 has now stepped out of the courtroom again. Any uh, additional questions that the people are asking me um, to ask this juror or any additional record that people are asking me to make or any additional requests from the people? No, Judge, we just would reiterate that uh, there will be no testimony from this individual. Okay, all right, I just, I wanted to ask just to be, just to be safe. All right, any uh, additional questions the defense wants me to ask uh, juror 535 or any additional record the defense wants me to make or any uh, additional action the defense wants me to take? No, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, let's bring in juror number 872 then.
the record should reflect that juror number 872 is now present in the courtroom. Um, have a seat. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Um, okay. <laughs> okay. I, w I was told that you um, were having some issues with respect to daycare and, and so I wanted to see if, if you wanted to um, uh, or what you wanted to tell me about that. Um, not yet. Um, oh, my kids get out of school in two and a half weeks. Oh, so okay. I wasn't, I'm not too sure yet. Oh, I see. Um, but I had mentioned to the other lady, um, I had asked her about, because in the beginning they had said, you know, there's a daycare that you can take them to that'll take them all day. But she said it doesn't start till 8.30, so. It, it, they actually open the doors at 8, but because this case is as long as it is, um, that's not a service that's available for jurors in this case. Okay. So, but if it's not an issue yet that we need to address, then we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, if we, if we have to. I mean, it sounds like there's a possibility that this will not be an issue, so. Right, I just haven't figured it out yet. That would be my first choice, but okay. if not, then I can look into other options. Great, okay, let me know if you need to talk to me in two and a half weeks or whenever at some <laughs> point in the future, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, the record should reflect that juror number A72 has exited the courtroom now. Any additional record uh, that the people are asking me to make or any additional action that people are asking me to take? No, Your Honor, thank you. Same question for the defense. Any additional uh, record that you're asking me to make or any additional action you're asking me to take? Well, thank you. All right, thank you. Let's uh, bring the jury in then. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has joined us again. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. At the end of the morning session, uh, CSI um, Petalina was on the stand, and the prosecution has asked for permission to interrupt her testimony so that they can call two other witnesses. Uh, so 
we can accommodate their schedule. And without objection, I have allowed that. So at this time, please call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Despina Papa George. your right hand for me so that I can administer an oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm in the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please be seated. Could you please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names? Despina Fafudis Papa George, D-E-S-P-I-N-A, F-A-F-O-U-T-I-S, P A. P-A-G-E-O-R-G-E. -E. Thank you. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, would you please tell us what you do for a living? I work at Google as a custodian of records. What was the name of the company again? Google. I'm not sure I've heard of it. What do they do? It's an internet company providing free services such as email, search, among others. And what's your role in that company? I respond to legal process served on Google for user account information. And do you do that a lot? Yes. How long have you been at Google? Five years. And in those five years, how many requests for subscriber information, including emails and things like that, have you dealt with? In the thousands. Are you a custodian of records for Google? Yes. Have you testified in that capacity before? Yes. Across the country? Yes. Anywhere outside the country? No. Um, how many times? Roughly 15 to 20 times. Okay. Um, if I wanted to get access to the contents of a subscriber's uh, email, how do I do that? We require a legal process in order to release any user information and upon receipt of the legal process, we verify the validity and get an understanding of the type of user data that's being requested. And so long as it's a valid legal request and the type of data that they're seeking we can access, we will use internal tooling to essentially extract the user data or make a copy of it, place it on a disk, and Federal Express it over to the requesting party. What else do you include with the disk that you send back? That depends on the type of user data that's being requested. Let's say it's uh, emails. We will place the email uh, file on the disk. And uh, you'll send it back with some documentation? Yes, typically the production letter or cover letter, the certificate of authenticity, and a copy of the hash values that were captured at the time of production. We'll talk about hash values here in just a second. Um, actually, you know, I'll take. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with what's been marked as, oops, I'll move that. People's one two one zero A, B, and C, and one two one one A, B, and C. Yes. Ma'am, I'm handing you what I just described on the record as the two exhibits. Now, those are clasped together with a, a clip. You can go ahead and take that clip off, and then if you would for us, tell us if you recognize the A, B, and C components of exhibit 1210. Yes. Tell us what 1210A is. This is a copy of the cover letter, certificate of authenticity, and a copy of the hash values of the production files. How does that get generated? At the time of production by one of the legal assistants processing the legal request. Now, is your signature the one that appears on that document? No. Whose signature is on that document? Emmy Tran. And do you know who Emmy Tran is? Yes. Who is she? A former colleague on our team. And was she also acting in the capacity that you act as the custodian of records? Yes. 
these documents, all of these things, uh, including the emails, are they maintained in the ordinary course of business? Yes. And these documents, are these generated pursuant to the legal requests for those business records? Yes. The uh, Exhibit 1210A, is that a fair and accurate copy of the documents that were generated for the particular email address we're about to discuss? Yes. Tell us what email address those documents pertain to. dsherlockb at gmail.com. Okay. Now tell us about 1210B. This is the production disk containing the user files. Now when you say containing the user files, tell us what is on there. In response to this legal request, we provided subscriber information with IP authentication and the email contents of the Google account. Let's talk about the limitations of what's included in those email contents. When you, when Google puts all that onto that disk, when you do that, tell us what's included from the person's email. Everything that was in the user's email account and any deleted emails that had not yet been purged from the system. We'll talk about the deleted in a moment. Now, I know from having a Gmail account that you can put things in different folders. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, do those show up in there separated by the folders that the user created? No, we do not parse out by filters or folders for the inbox file. It is a complete snapshot of everything that was in the Google user's account. Received, sent, everything. Yes. Now you said any deleted items that hadn't been purged. Talk to us about that process. When a user deletes their email, it will remain on our systems no longer than 60 days before being completely purged by Google servers within Google servers. So this particular disk that was generated for dsherlockb at gmail.com, this disk, so that I'm clear, drafted, received, that wasn't otherwise deleted more than 60 days before? Yes. Okay. Now that disk, that was And I compared the hash values of these disks to the hash value that we have stored in our system that was created at the time of the production back in 2012. And here the hash values matched, uh, the disk hash values matched to the hash values we had stored in our system. So any manipulation to one of these files would have altered that hash value, but again here they matched. Can we pretend I don't know what a hash value is? What is that? A hash value is a unique algorithm, uh, so any manipulation to that file would change that algorithm. And so in this case, did you initial the disk after you verified that it contained the exact same contents that were produced at Google back in 2012? Yes. And so that's it. That's, that's the accurate copy of what was sent out. Yes. Now the disk also contains um, all of the emails you said. Do you personally go through and review each of those emails? No. At the time of production, we'll use an internal tool that will make an exact copy of the email, and we do not look at the contents of that file. We just put it on the disk and send that out. Now let's just say hypothetically we were able to find someone, maybe an FBI agent, to go through that disk and pull out the emails that are on that disk. Can we have confidence that the emails that are pulled off of that disk are the ones that existed in electronic uh, format in that particular email inbox? Yes. Okay. There's another document there. One, two, one, zero.
know that that is the accurate information that's at least maintained by Google. This is what was captured from our system at the time of production. And that's maintained in the ordinary course of business just like the other documents? Yes. Can you take a look please at people's 1211, that's that other batch, A, B, and C. You have that? Yes. Now, we're not going to spend as much time going through the details of those, but if you would, for the record, tell us what 1211A is. The cover letter, certi certificate of authenticity, and the copy of the production hash values. And are those things all uh, generated uh, as part of the business records and business practices of Google? Yes. What email address do those pertain to? Classicjimbo at gmail.com. Okay. And um, 1211B, is that the disk that goes with that email account? Yes. Everything you testified to for 1210B about uh, dsherlockb at gmail.com, do those same things apply to this disk as well? Yes. Tell us what one. Classic. Take a look at that 1211C, please, if you would. There are several different entries of information that appear on that subscriber, what do you call it, a subscriber page? What is it? Subscriber information page. Okay, thank you. Um, the information that's contained on there, where does that, where, where does it come from? Different places or all one place? Some of the fields are user generated and some fields are captured at the time of the account creation. Okay. Take a look at 1210C. And that should be the subscriber user information, more words, page for dsherlockb at gmail.com. Same thing? Yes. Now for that particular um, email account, is there something called SMS and a phone number listed on there? Yes. Who puts that phone number in there? The user will place the SMS number there. You know, at this time I'm going to move for the admission of uh, People's Exhibits 1210A and C and 1211A and C into evidence. Any objection? Your Honor, if I may have a moment and if I could uh, take a look at the exhibits again. Yes. Do you want Mr. me to retrieve? Yes, yes, I will. Please let uh, <coughs> Ms. Spengler have a moment with those. And that one, too. yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep the clicky. And Ms. Spengler, do you have a copy of those disks, or do you need a moment to review those disks as well? Let me just move the disks themselves. Okay. But I was just wondering if you needed to see that before you took a position on the other <laughs> items. Uh, no, okay.
Can we approach? Yes.
All right, the hearsay objection is, is sustained, but uh, Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. I think you need to turn your mic on. <laughs> um, Ma'am, those records, are they generated automatically in the Google servers as the user creates them? Yes. What else about those records, that they're maintained in the ordinary course of business? Yes. And when they're automatically generated in the Google servers, are they generated at the time they're made or even within a reasonable period of time after they're made? Yes. And does that count not only for the disk that is 1210B and 1211B, but also for the information contained on 1210C and 1211C? Yes. Then, Your Honor, uh, based on our uh, conversation at the bench, I'm going to move to admit People's Exhibits 1210C and 1211C into evidence. Ms. Pingler? A moment. Yes, take your time. Thank you. Yes.
Folks, thank you for your patience. Uh, without objection, and based on the understanding that we have at the bench, uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first off, did you know technology is supposed to make your life easier? Did you know that? Because um, can I ask you, and Judge, have we admitted then uh, people's 1210C? Yes, one, uh, P-TR-1210C and 1211C are both admitted without objection, uh, but uh, with the understanding that we had, uh, or based on the discussion that we had at the bench, the understanding of how you're going to proceed. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. With your permission, Judge, I'd like to publish 1210. Go ahead. C. Go ahead. On the TV. Okay. Um, you know what? Let's start with that bottom part first since we just had a conversation about that. Ma'am, can you blow up the uh, login stuff? All right. Tell us what this is right here, would you? This is the IP login logout authentication. Now, this one appears to only go back to July the 5th, and there is this other exhibit that you're going to see from defense D-TR-17 that goes back to June the 26th. Have you seen that one already? Yes. Can you help us understand why Google only maintains uh, the different, I guess, login dates going back to July the 5th on one and July the 22nd, I'm sorry, on the other one? June, June 22nd on the other one. June 22nd on the other one. Thank you, Your Honor. At the time of production in 2012, Google only retained the most recent 28 days of IP login and logout events. And so, so that I'm clear, there may have been a jillion more login entries going back to the creation of this email account, but Google only holds on to the most recent 28 days. Is that fair? Yes. And to understand the difference between the dates that this goes back to, which is July the 5th, and the one that Defense 17 goes back to, which is June 22nd, is a product of when that snapshot was taken of that account? Yes. Okay. Did I say that right? Did I say it right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they're both accurate. It's just a question of when they got captured. Is that fair? Yes. All right. C can you please show us the top part of that uh, 1210C? All right, tell us what we're looking at here. This is the Google account subscriber information for dsherlockb at gmail.com. Now it says names up there, James Holmes. Who types that name in? <coughs> the user will enter the name. And the email address, who picks it? The user. Uh, when it says status enabled, do you know what that means? That the account is active. Uh, services there? Android, books, all that stuff. Well, what are all those things? This is a list of the services the user has registered for, although some of these are readable products and others are labels that are internal um, descriptors that I don't know the meaning of. Okay. Um, it says secondary email address on there. Who inputs that information? The user will input the secondary email at the time of creation. Now, that secondary email, is that typically verified by Google, or can you almost type in anything? Am, is this a secret, by the way, we're not supposed to talk about? The user can enter the email account, and it typically is not verified. Okay. And the created on date, who puts that information in? That is captured at the time that the user has created their Google account. So this is Google telling us when that email was created? Yes. What is the IP address list that's on there? That is the creation IP address also captured by Google at the time that the account has been created. Uh, language code EN. I'm going to trust that's Dutch. English. Okay. <laughs> the SMS, is that the cell phone number that we talked about earlier? Yes. Who types that number in? The user. How about the, uh, the nickname? Who puts that information in? The user. Other usernames, who puts that in? The user. And how about, that's all I see on there, Pre previous emails, 
I'm not sure how that's generated. Okay. Do you know how that's generated? I don't know. Okay. All right, so there are several line items on here that Google generates, but the rest of it is created by the user. Yes. So, so that we're clear, too, you can't tell us that a person in this room named James Holmes was the one that created this email, can you? No. You can only tell us that someone that created this account claimed to be James Holmes, picked the email address, chose the English language, typed in the SMS cell phone number, chose the nickname, and chose the other usernames. Is that fair? Yes. Is this same information with some variation, is this same type of information captured on, bless you, what's been admitted is one two, bless you, one two one one C? Yes. Okay. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Can, can we just approach very quickly on one small thing and then I'll turn it over to... Yes. All right, Mr. Brockler? I don't have any further questions for this witness. Thank you. All right. Ms. Spengler, do you have cross-examination? I may approach the witness with what's been marked as defendant 17. Yes, you may. And if it helps, Your Honor, we'll stipulate to the admissibility of that if it'll save some time. All right. Ms. Spengler, you do want this exhibit admitted, correct? I do. Okay. It is admitted, uh, but if you wish to ask questions, uh, I'll give you that opportunity. I'll just have you um, describe what I handed to you. This is the account subscriber information and IP login events for dsherlockb at gmail.com. Okay, and is the content of Defense 17 similar to, um, but contains additional information to the people's exhibit related to the dsherlockb at hotmail.com account? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions and would move for admission if it hasn't already been admitted. I, I've admitted it. No problem. Okay. Any redirect? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. The jury does not appear to have any questions for this witness. Mr. Brockler, may this witness be released from her subpoena? Yes, sir. Ms. Spengler, do you have any objection? Yes. Take your time. We have no objection to her being released. Okay. Ma'am, thank you. With the court's permission, could I retrieve, thank you, ma'am, could I retrieve the unadmitted uh, exhibits B on 1210 and 1211? Yes. And then we should mark them in accordance with my instructions uh, for the record. All right, call your next witness, please. People call Joel Jaffe. your right hand so that I can administer an oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. Please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names. Joel Sir Jaffe, J-O-E-L, 
S H U R E J A F F E. I'm going to ask you to uh, move the microphone closer to you so that we can all hear you. You can move the microphone and you can move the chair too, both. Thank okay. you. You may proceed, Mr. Edson. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? I work for a company called Shomer Tech. How do you spell Shomer Tech? S H O M E R dash T E C. What is Shomer Tech? Shomer Tech's a company in Washington State that uh, sells primarily goods related to law enforcement, security, military. Do you sell products uh, wholesale? Yes, uh, actually most of our business is wholesale, the majority of it. To what type of customers? Uh, various resellers that sell in different industries. Do you also have a retail operation as well? We do. It's all online retail. Specifically, your online retail, is that something that uh, general members of the public, non-law enforcement, can order certain items, pay for them, and have them sent to their locations? Yes, they can. How long have you been with Shomer Tech? Uh, 32 years, give or take. Uh, did you start Shomer Tech? No. Fair to say you were with Shomer Tech in uh, 2012? Yes, that's correct. Back in late July, actually early August of 2012, were you contacted by any members of law enforcement related to um, items that may have been ordered by an individual purported to be James Holmes? Yes. Did you provide records related to uh, sales of particular items from Shomer Tech to James Holmes? I did. Are you a custodian of records for Shomer Tech? Yes. Just in general, how does Shomer Tech keep records information for customers and related to customer orders? For online orders? Yeah, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll talk uh, about online retail orders. Sure. Well, when the order comes in, uh, we keep the original as it comes into us. Uh, it leads to generation of our own invoice from that. And uh, at the end of the process, Attached that invoice will be all the uh, documentation relating to the shipping of that order. Are those records and invoices, as you described them, are they kept in the normal and ordinary course of your business? Yes, they are. Are they the type of items that, if you were asked at a later time by someone in law enforcement, that you could retrieve from uh, your uh, operations? Yes, as long as it's not more than seven or eight years. Okay. Fair to say that when you were contacted by law enforcement in August of 2012, you were able to provide them records from uh, an order by James Holmes yes. in, in 2012 as well, correct? Yes. Governor, may I approach the witness, please? Yes. handed you what's been previously marked as People's Exhibit 307. Do you recognize those two documents? Yes, I do. In general, what are those documents? Uh, the first one is uh, our invoice that we generate as a result of receiving the order, and the second page is the is a online order in the format that we would have first seen it. Those two online and the invoice that you're referring to, do they relate to a particular uh, customer? Yes, they do. Who is that customer? James Holmes. Do they relate to a particular date associated with an order? They do. What is that date? Well, the order was showing it's June 6th. Uh, there's no, there's no time stamp, only a date stamp, but I can tell from, from this that it would have come somewhere between... 2.30 in the afternoon, midnight that day, and the second document is dated the next day, June 7th, is when the invoice was actually processed. 
and that would be 2012? 2012. 2012. Um, the second page of the uh, People's Exhibit 307, if you turn it over, there appears to be some handwriting on the back of that. Do you see that? I do. Are you familiar with that? That's my handwriting. Okay. Did you write that uh, name and number down on the back? I, I did. Um, that was the name of the ATF agent who contacted me on the phone. And I just, for some reason, wrote it down on this document. Okay. Fair to say that's not part of your actual invoice and records. That's just your own handwriting, writing down a name and number? That's correct. Okay. So aside from that name and number that we just talked about, do the two documents contained within 307, People's Exhibit 307, do they fairly and accurately depict the invoice and documentation of this particular sale to this particular customer kept in your ordinary and routine course of business for Shomer Tech? Yes, sir. Judge, I would move at this time for People's Exhibit 307 to be admitted. Any objection? Ms. Can we, can we approach briefly? Yes. The, uh, there is no objection, so the exhibit is admitted P-TR-307 with the uh, agreement reached at the bench between the parties. There you go, sir. Sir, in general, what are some of the items that Shomer Tech sells? Well, there's actually quite a variety of them, but they range anywhere from electronic items to survival items, all variety of things. Judge, I would request permission to publish uh, a couple of pages of People's Exhibit 307. Go ahead. If I could please have the first page, 307-1. Uh, a couple of things here, sir, some, some ground rules for our court. I just need you to keep speaking into the microphone for me, please. Um, I have published the first page, the invoice from Shomer Tech that you have in front of you as well for People's Exhibit 307. Um, and I'm just going to have you talk about a few of the items there. If you feel the need to uh, stand up and point some things out specifically, let me know. We've got a pointer, and I've also got a handheld microphone. Okay. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to ask you is, um, to the left of the top of the first page of 307, uh, we see the your Shomer Tech logo and, and information. Under there it says sold to. Who is this <coughs> invoice sold to? Well, the sold to is, is something we ask for. This information is provided by the person ordering it. Um, but that's, if they're using a credit card, that typically would be the bill to address. And in this particular uh, invoice, who is the sold to information related to? James Holmes. What is the address? 1690 Paris Street, number 10, Aurora, Colorado, 80010. To the right of... So, just kind of move to the right there. I, I see a date. Uh, it appears to be 6-7-2012. What does that date relate to? That's the date the invoice was actually generated and processed. Okay. Um, right below that it says terms. What does that relate to? That's payment terms. Okay. In this case, this is a, a um, Visa or MasterCard. Okay. We'll, we'll look at the second page and get some more specificity on that. If we could scroll down a little bit more, please, on the first page. Um, there in the middle of the screen, uh, I see some quantity orders, quantity shipped, uh, and I see about four different things, but it looks like it's three specific items. Can you talk about that for the jury, please? Yeah, that's just an itemization of the orders. That's what we use to actually pull the order from when the items are pulled, um, put in the, the basket, so to speak. Uh, it's circled at that moment, and the second column there marked quantity shipped 
So what's actually pulled and the circle around that number indicates it actually came off the shelf and into the basket. Uh, it's more just an internal um, check on that. Um, the uh, next column would be quantity back ordered. Uh, if we're out of, item, out of stock of an item, we would uh, back order it. In this case, everything was in stock and shipped in that shipment. Let me just ask you real quick before I interrupt. Well, actually, I just did interrupt, but if I, before I uh, have you go any further, um, is Shomer Tech a company that actually keeps on invoice these items, or do you send the order to somebody else who ships it out? No, we stock and ship all of our items in our warehouse. Including this invoice? Correct. Okay, I'm going to move you to the description. I, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to tell the jury what the three different items were that were ordered and the quantities each, please. The first item, which uh, was shipped in a quantity of two ordered, um, are handcuffs. And the next word just refers to the color of them as opposed to a different color available. Uh, the second item is road stars. The quantity is one. That particular one is one unit of sale, which is a box of four individual ones. Uh, and the next item, uh, meal spec, first aid dressing, it's uh, um, basically a, a bandage, trauma bandage, uh, quantity one of those, which is a single unit. I'm going to direct your attention again back to the road stars. How many were requested? Two units of sale, which is a total of eight individual stars. Okay, the road stars come in packs of four, is that fair to say? That's one of the options. That's the option that was ordered on this particular order was a pack of four. Okay, just so we're all on the same page here, how many total road stars were ordered? Eight. Eight, eight stars, which, eight? Is, which is two boxes of four. Thank you. Um, that fourth line there, is that shipping and handling? That's the shipping and handling charge. It's a flat fee for every order. It's the same, 9.95. Okay. If we could just scroll down pretty much to the bottom there. Um, this is, it's hard to read on this copy here for the jury, but you have the actual copy in front of you I as do. well. What was the, the grand total of this order from Shomer Tech? Uh, $80.94. A couple of other things. I, I see at the bottom right, <coughs> it is sideways here, but it says there's a big words phone order in the middle. What is that referring to? Well, that's the nature. All, all, basically it's, uh, for credit cards, it's customer not present or customer present. When it's not present, it just automatically prints out phone order. It's beyond our control. It's not a phone order in this case. It was uh, an online order. Okay. I'm going to direct your attention to the left of the screen there. I again see your logo, Shomer Tech. Above that, I see a ship to. Do you see where I'm referring to? Yes. Right above that, I see some numbers. What does that relate to? That's a phone number on all online orders. We request a, or require a phone number. Um, and that was the order that was provided on the, on the order form, the 858 being the area code, 449-7348 being the phone number. Who would provide that number? The person ordering it. Okay. If we could just scroll up just a little bit, please. Right there. Thank you. Um, at the top, I see a thank you for your order. Do you see what I'm talking about? I do. Below that, I've got a, a lot of information that's kind of a little bit smaller. Are you familiar <coughs> with that particular information? Yes. Please describe for the jury what all that information relates to. Okay, well, that, that actually is a sticker that's put on. I don't know if you can tell from that, but it is a sticker that's affixed. That is a, basically a receipt when we generate a shipping label from United Parcel Service. The main portion is the actual label. It goes on the parcel. And for our record keeping, we take the small portion off the bottom, and we stick it right on the invoice form so that information will always accompany the paperwork for that order. And uh, that's, that's what that portion of it is. Um, the first thing that is listed is our shipper number in the top left there. Uh, the next thing is the date. The, the order is actually processed. What is that date? It's June 7th, 2012. That's processing date, not necessarily order date? It's processing and pickup date. That would go out in that date's UPS. Okay. Next. From your actual invoice. I'm sorry, from your actual inventory? Correct. The next item on the first line, uh, it's an abbreviation for actual weight. And the actual weight of this particular parcel is 3.3 pounds. Um, the next one is uh, number PK1. I believe that means it's a single package shipment. I'm not positive on that, though. On the second line, the SBC uh, GNDRES indicates um, the service level and, and the 
after that, the GNDRS means the ground shipment to an address that's designated as a residential address. Would that be the same address as the ship to address that you have in this document? Exactly. Um, I see there, um, I guess it's the fourth line down, it says invoice number. Does yes, that's a, that's a number that we enter, so we can cross-reference that, and the 71935 corresponds with our invoice number that's at the top of that sheet. So um, it's tough to see on the one that's on the screen, but the, yeah. the actual exhibit you have in your hand, uh, People's Exhibit 307, does it have that sticker that you're referring to? Yes, the actual sticker is here. Okay. Um, based on that sticker and the information you just testified, are you uh, indicating that, in fact, this order was fulfilled and shipped out as you've testified to? Yes. We could go to the second page of the invoice. This would be 307-2, please. Yes. Do you see that? I do. This also says invoice, but what is this document? <clears throat> this is a document. This, when someone orders online, this is the, the format that we receive it in first. Okay. Um, where it says invoice, that's generated based on how many orders that come in that year. Frankly, we pay no attention to that. And when we generate an invoice, it creates a new and unique number. And that invoice never really had any relevance. My question is the order date. What is the order date? The order date is 6-6-2012. Six, six, so is that the date that the order would have come in online? Yes, that's the date it would come in. It's not time stamped, but I can tell uh, that that would have come in after 2.30 that day. June 6, 2012? Yes. Billing information again to James Holmes? Yeah, this is how it's originally entered by the person ordering it. Okay. It's exactly, that's the only place this information comes from. Under the bill to? Yes. Okay, so somebody would have had it to actually type James Holmes? The person placing the order would have to, yes. Okay, what is that, uh, appears to be an email address, what's that email address? It's D as in David, Sherlock, B as in boy, at hotmail.com. And again, the address under that, please. 1690 Paris Street, number 10, Aurora, Colorado, 80010. And all of that is information that would have been inputted uh, by the user, the individual purchasing or requesting purchase of those items. Is that correct? That's correct. The ship to is the same information. Is that fair to say? Correct. Uh, walk me through briefly, if you would please, the payment that was used for this order. Uh, the payment submitted was uh, MasterCard under the name of James Holmes. Uh, they indicated the issue in bank was USAA. It I'll just have you go through, what were the last four digits of the credit card? 2217. Okay. If we could scroll down a bit, please. Actually, go ahead and tell me what the expiration date of that. September 2014. The day phone, is that the same phone number you just described earlier, sir? I believe it was 858-449-7348. Yes, that would be the same. And again, you get that information from the person placing the order? Correct. Okay. If we could scroll, scroll down a bit more, please. Um, this information at the bottom here, uh, is this the same uh, <coughs> description and descriptive information of what the actual order was for? Yes, the customer would enter actually just clicks on an icon that says buy it and then would, would enter a quantity of us other than one, uh, but they wouldn't actually fill out the, the name of the product. So again, as you testified to, we're talking about the two pairs of handcuffs, the one first aid dressing and the two sets of road stars? Correct. If we could scroll down to the bottom here of this exhibit, this again 307. Uh, again, this page shows the order total, is that correct? Yes, and we make sure that matches the invoice total. And did that in this case? It did. And how much was that for? $80.94. We could scroll up just a bit more, please. Now, you testified that you actually keep the inventory um, on property, fair to say? Yes, we do. Are you familiar with these particular handcuffs that were ordered in this uh, particular order? Yes. Are you familiar with the first aid dressing that was ordered? Yes. Are you familiar with the road stars that were ordered? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, may I approach the witness for some already uh, previously admitted uh, evidence? Yes. Thank you.
sir, I have placed before you two items of evidence that have already been admitted in this case. The first is People's Exhibit 454, which are some uh, empty handcuff boxes. Do you see that? I do. Do you recognize those boxes? Yes. What are those boxes? Those are the original product boxes that the handcuffs would come in. Could I also have uh, published People's Exhibit 4079? It's a photograph already admitted, Your Honor. Okay. Sir, People's Exhibit 4079 is on the screen there. Can you see that? I can. Are those the same, a uh, picture of the same uh, boxes? Yes, they are. Could I also have People's Exhibit 4080? It's already been admitted as well, Your Honor. Yes. Does this appear to be the back of those boxes? Yes. If you could please, the, the top of the back of those boxes appear to have some writing on them. Are you familiar with those writings? Yes. What, describe what those are for the jury, please. Those are serial numbers. Are you familiar with how those serial numbers are placed on those boxes? I believe they're written, handwritten on at the factory. Okay. To the best of your knowledge, well, let me ask this. Let me backtrack. First of all, is it accurate that these were not the first set of these types of handcuffs that you had sold previously from Shomer Tech? They're not the first set. Okay. Is it common to receive these types of handcuffs with these handwritten serial numbers on the back of those boxes? Yes. Um, these particular boxes, they're before you as well in People's Exhibit 454. Can you make out the serial numbers handwritten in the back? I can. Okay. Um, in your experience, do those handwritten serial numbers, do they generally correspond with serial numbers that are on the actual handcuffs inside of those boxes? Yes. You have before you also People's Exhibit 666. Do you see that? It's a physical exhibit right there in front of you. Oh, yes. Do you see that? I do. What, are the, what does that appear to be? It appears to be a pair of handcuffs. Okay. If we could go back to People's Exhibit 4079, please. Thank you. This is the front of the box. What is the um, name of these particular type of handcuffs, I guess, for lack of a better term here? Well, the brand name is HWC. Okay. People's Exhibit 666, the actual handcuffs yourselves, do they have a brand name on them as well? They do. What is that? HWC. People's Exhibit 666, the uh, handcuffs, do they have a serial number on them? They do. What is that serial number? 436954. Could I have you also look at the boxes, that's People's Exhibit 454, and tell me if one of the two of those boxes match as far as serial numbers go? It does. Okay. People's Exhibit 4080, could I have that again, please? Thank you. Um, if you would, please tell me again the serial number for the handcuffs in People's Exhibit 666. 436954. Okay, does that match which of those two boxes? It matches the one on the left. Okay, thank you. The, it's still on the screen for record purposes, People's Exhibit 4080. <coughs> what is the serial number for the box on the right? Four three six nine five four. The box on, oh, the, on the right. I'm sorry. Four three six nine four eight. Okay. Could I please have People's Exhibit four three nine one? It's in a photo already admitted. Okay. Sir, do you see uh, People's Exhibit four three nine one on the screen? Yes. Uh, what is the brand? name of these handcuffs? HWC. What is the serial number for that particular pair of handcuffs? 436948. Is 
Does that match the same serial number you just read from the uh, second box from People's Exhibit 454? Yes. Thank you. Those particular handcuffs that we just uh, described, the ones that were um, the HWC handcuffs, are those law enforcement type handcuffs? <coughs> Um, well, if there's professional grade and non-professional grade, I would put this at the very low end of professional grade. Okay. Could I please have People's Exhibit 2163, another photo already admitted? Okay. Can you see that photograph? Yes. Are you familiar with any items associated with this photograph? Yes. What are you familiar with? The everything other than the sunglasses. Okay. What is everything other than the sunglasses? Those are commonly referred to as road stars. Are those the same type of road stars that were uh, purchased that's contained within People's Exhibit 307? They are. Are you familiar with uh, road stars? I am. Are these particular types of road stars ones that are sold by Shomer Tech? Yes. Are they also kept on uh, inventory with Shomer Tech? Yes. Uh, what are road stars? <coughs> well, a Roadstar is another name for something known as a caltrop. Um, dates back to the Roman, em uh, uh, Roman Empire times. And what they w were designed for, they're, they're metal, they're fashioned in a manner so that if you throw them on the ground, no matter how they're thrown, one of its spikes always uh, is pointed straight up. Have you yourself uh, observed these types of, of Roadstars? I have. Um, are they sharp? They're somewhat sharp. They don't need to be super sharp to, to be effective. Okay. How might they be effective? <clears throat> well, originally they were designed as a, as a perimeter defense device. Uh, in I'm going to object to the historical recitation. Sustain. Just from your knowledge, what are they used for? A number of uses. The primary one probably would be perimeter defense. What do you mean by perimeter defense? Well, if, um, if you need to quickly guard a large uh, area uh, in, in a very quick manner uh, against primarily vehicles, not necessarily exclusively, um, typically they would be used, for example, uh, just prior to the U.S. invasion of Panama in 1989, where it needed to quickly secure an airport. I they object. Sustained. Okay, just your knowledge. What, what I'm asking is, what are they used for? That's my question. A major use would be perimeter defense. Okay. Could that include perimeter defense of vehicles? Yes. Thank you. You can take that down. The... Um, we could have, again, the first page of People's Exhibit 307, please. If we could go to the kind of sort of the middle where the items were listed. Sir, I'm going to direct your attention to the third item listed. It says MIL SPEC first aid dressing. Are you familiar with that item? Yes. Tell the jury, what is that item? Basically a, a first aid bandage, a trauma bandage, about four inches by six inches in size. Thank you. Uh, if I could also have backup 2163. To your knowledge, are the road stars that are contained, like we're seeing here in People's Exhibit 2163, are they effective uh, perimeter defense like you talked about against tires? Yes. I have nothing further at this time. Thank you, Judge. All right. Cross-examination, Ms. Brady? No questions. Thank you, sir. All right. And the jury does not appear to have any questions. May this witness be released from his subpoena, Mr. Edson? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Any objection, Ms. Brady? No. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, members of the jury, it's about 3 o'clock, so let's go ahead and take our afternoon break. Please remember that my advisements apply during the break. 
and I'll see you back here at 3.20. Thank you. The uh, record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom now. Everyone may be seated. Uh, 1210B and 1211B, um, the people are going to mark that as a court trial exhibit. Is that right? 1210B and 1211B. What are we up to? 18. So the next one is 18. All right, so those should be marked as uh, Court Trial Exhibit 18 and Court Trial Exhibit 19. Does that apply, Your Honor, also to uh, the objective ones that we have covered with the testimony of Harris and the 1211 That's what I'm referring to. I'm sorry. Oh, did I? I thought that 12, I'm sorry, no, maybe I'm the one mistaken. Uh, I, I guess we only admitted 1210C and 1211C, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, so this applies to 1210A and 1211A, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Um, and then, Mr. Edson, in terms of um, People's Exhibit 307, you're going to make the change that we talked about, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I'll do that at the break, and I'll show Ms. Brady. Great. Okay. Anything else uh, that we need to talk about at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Um, we still have Maria Petalina on the stand, however. We have three victims whose families flew in from out of town to be present for their testimony today, so I would be asking to reset Ms. Petalina and to call the victims if that is acceptable to the court and to the defense. And if, in fact, we end up short on witnesses, we have a couple of very brief witnesses who we could put on to, to fill that time. All right. Is there any objection? No objection. All right. Without objection, that's fine. Uh, do you need me to uh, continue her subpoena? You do not need to, Your Honor. Okay. Anything uh, on behalf of the defense? Yes, Your Honor. I would ask, though, if we're no longer having the earlier witness in the courtroom that we pack up or put away some of the exhibits that she was referring to, such as the drywall and the railing that's on the table. All right. Any objection? Are you going to ask to publish any of these exhibits? I am, but not today. Okay. All right. So we'll take them back then. Mr. Orman. If I could have the court's indulgence, Your Honor. I know this is an unusual request. I would like to photograph the current state of the model just so that I have a record of what it looked like at the end of today. Um, and if you want, I can give a, court, a copy to the court. I don't think that's necessary, but I would just like to be able to have that for our purposes. I, I don't have any, any problem with that. Any objection? No objection, but I would like a copy to go to the court. Okay. We'll, we'll, put, we'll mark it as a court exhibit. All right? Okay. Thank you. The court will be in recess.